Morning, everybody. There's a lot of people here. You guys pumped? All right, everyone's awake. That's good. Uh, so my name is John Kitzmiller. I'm a professional services engineer with Jamf Software. I see several people I think I've jump-started in the room. It's awesome to see you all here. Uh, with me today is someone who really shouldn't need an introduction. I think everyone in this room at one point or another has interacted with this gentleman, uh, whether it be through Twitter or Jamf Nation or his wonderful blog. Um, so I'm just going to shut up and get out of his way. Uh, Rich Trout and everyone here to not talk about File Vault for once. So, as John mentioned, I'm not here to talk about File Vault 2. Uh, instead, I'm here to uh, talk about uh, bringing the Casper suite to life with virtual test environments. So, uh, as John mentioned, uh, my name is Rich Trout, and I'm the lead help desk technician at the uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, I'm very happy to be working with John on this presentation. He was actually the one who gave me the idea for it, uh, and I'm very happy that uh, it worked out as well as it did. Um, before we get started, there's two things I'd like to mention. The first is that all the slides, speakers notes, and the demos are gonna be available for download, and I'm gonna be providing a link at the end of the talk. I tend to be one of those folks who can't keep up with the speaker and take notes at the same time, so for those folks in the same situation, there's no need to take notes. Everything I'm covering is gonna be available for download. Uh, the second, Please hold all questions until the end. Uh, if you've got questions, make a note of them, and either hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A afterwards, I'm pretty sure we will, or you can also talk with me afterwards. Um, with luck, I'll be able to answer most of your questions during the talk itself. So when new software appears, we all need test boxes that match our standard configuration in order to verify that the new software isn't adversely affecting anything. Now, this usually means admins need to get, have an available test box and they need to go find one. The advent of good virtualization solutions means it's easier than ever before to perform testing without needing to collect and use physical test boxes. So VMware Fusion and VMware ESXi have been virtualization solutions I've been using, so let's talk about how you can use these tools to quickly build test VMs that match your needs. So in VMware Fusion 5, VMware added Netboot support for virtual machines running Mac OS X. Now, this has proved to be an enormous boon to uh, Mac events because for those who use Netboot to help set up their machines, they, you can now build your VMs just like you can build your actual Macs. So two tools that can be used to build VMs with Netboot are Deploy Studio and Jamf's Casper Imaging. Now Netboot sets associated with these tools allow Mac admins to boot their VM from the relevant Netboot set and then apply whatever installs and configurations are needed. Now in my own shop, uh, my preferred tool for building VMs is Deploy Studio. Now, Deploy Studio offers great flexibility when building Macs, and that same versatility can be applied to VMs. So, I'm using Create OS X Install PKG in my own shop to generate OS X installers, which I then use with Deploy Studio to help me build VM templates. Now, for those unfamiliar with it, Create OS X Install PKG is a tool created by Greg Nagel at Disney. Now, it's used to build individual installer packages that can install OS X Lion, Mountain Lion, Mavericks, and now Yosemite, in the same way that you could install Microsoft Office or other applications. Now the advantage of using this tool is that a number of systems management tools, including Casper, uh, can deploy the installers created by this tool. So that allows OS X installations and upgrades to be performed by the systems management tool that you're already using at your shop. So one great thing about using this tool is that Create OS X Install PKG will create an installer package that either installs a stock copy of OS X or you can add additional packages to the stock OS X install. Now, there are a couple of guidelines to keep in mind here. The first is there's about 350 megabytes of free space, and this can vary a bit per OS version that's available in the OS X installer. Now, this is sufficient space for a configuration or a bootstrapping package, but it's usually not a good idea to add Microsoft Office or other similar large applications. Now, the second is that the limitations of the OS install environment means that there's a number of installers that simply won't run correctly when you're uh, installing OS X um, through, create install P through create OS X install PKG. Now, in particular, packages that use pre-installation or post-installation scripts may fail to run properly when packages are run as part of the OS installation process. Now, to help work around this limitation, I developed a solution that I'll be discussing in more detail later in the talk. So, Deploy Studio can deploy an OS installer built by Create OS X Install PKG, but you'll need to make sure that you've added Python support. Now, to add this support, you'll need to create your Deploy Studio boot set with Python selected as a tool to include in the boot 
beautiful system. Now, if you're using Casper Imaging, make sure that your uh, Netboot set includes that Python support. Now, shown on the screen, adding Python is a checkbox option in the Deploy Studio Assistant application that's used to create Deploy Studio boot sets. So all I have to do is check that box, and it's created as part of the uh, Netboot creation process. So deploy the OS installer in a new VM, set up a new workflow in Deploy Studio to install the package as a non-postponed install. Now, this is important because it'll set up a new VM's empty boot drive with the needed boot support to install OS X. Now, once a necessary workflow has been set up in Deploy Studio, you can set up a new VM. Now, in VMware Fusion, my normal method to create is to create a customized VM. So how you can do this is in the Create a uh, Virtual Machine window in VMware Fusion, you can access this by selecting More Options and then selecting Create a Custom Virtual Machine. So in the Choose Operating System window, set OS as appropriate. In this case, I'm setting up a Yosemite uh, VM. And in the Finish window, you would select Customize Settings. Now, this will allow you to change the VM settings ahead of its first boot. So when you go to Customize Your Settings, in the Network Adapter Settings, make sure to select Auto Detect under Bridge Networking. This will allow the VM to correctly boot from the Netboot set. Uh, you may also want to adjust the VM's available RAM and other settings at this point, but that's really up to you. The VM is now ready for its next steps. Now in this example, the VM is configured to use Yosemite as its OS, but it has a formatted and completely empty boot drive. So if the Deploy Studio boot set is set as the default boot set on your NetBoot server, you can start the VM and then do nothing. The VM should boot to Deploy Studio automatically after failing to boot from either the VM's hard drive or its optical drive. Now, alternatively, just like on a regular Mac, you can hold down the N key on your keyboard to boot the VM from the default netboot set. So, let's take a look at how this works. So, I booted to Deploy Studio, and for those unfamiliar with it, this is uh, the Deploy Studio runtime. And I'm going to go ahead and log into it. And I've got several workflows set up, and I'm going to choose install 1010 in a virtual machine. I'm going to go ahead and hit play. And normally, this can take a few minutes to run, but our time is valuable, so I've uh, utilized a little movie magic to make this go a little faster. So, uh, nine minutes later, um, we are now just about ready to install OS X. It's ready to set up and ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit quit. It's gonna automatically reboot. And because Create OS X Install PKG was targeted as an installer package onto uh, the Macintosh HD empty boot drive, it just will automatically, it doesn't ask you to select the boot drive, it just automatically starts installing. And if only all Yosemite installs went that fast, I'd use a little movie magic there too. So it's gonna automatically reboot after a few seconds. And now, here we are, we're at a factory fresh Yosemite install. And pretty much what did you have to do? You had to log into Deploy Studio, you had to select the correct workflow, you had to hit quit. You could have walked away for the rest of it. So this kind of automation is awesome. So the example I just described will set up a VM with only Yosemite installed, but you can customize further. Now in my own shop, I normally reboot back to Deploy Studio at this point and run additional workflows on the VM depending on how I want to set up my test VM. So in this case, I'm back in Deploy Studio. I'm going to select set up 1010 VM hit play, and in this case, you know, it's gonna run through the series of packages and scripts installs. It's gonna ask me what I wanna name it. In this case, I'm gonna stick with the default name that Deploy Studio is giving me, but I could have renamed it to anything I wanted to. And at this point, it's gonna go through an automated process where it sets up uh, for the next boot what it's gonna do, any packages that need to be installed, any Apple software updates that need to be put on. I'm installing a local administrator, I'm installing various applications, um, like Office, Reader, got a few others, like both versions of Java, because of course my shop uses Creative Suite 6, and that needs its Java 6 for the foreseeable future, unfortunately. Um, you know, I've got Sophos, because we need to uh, have our antivirus uh, protection installed. Adobe Flash Player, because, well, Flash. Um, my shop uses X Windows, so I'm installing uh, exports. A lot of folks in my shop use Xcode, so I'm also tossing that in. I've got a uh, script set up that will unhide the library folder inside uh, the user folder. And my shop also just renames our hard drive to Mac HD instead of Macintosh HD, so I'm just adding that into uh, my process. So now I'm gonna go ahead and hit quit. And at this point, I can pretty much go get coffee because the machine's gonna set itself up. So 
for those folks uh, not familiar with Deploy Studio, what's going to come up next is uh, Deploy Studio's uh, DS Finalize screen. And this is basically where it runs at first speed through all the things I just told it to do. Uh, any Apple software updates, in this case there weren't any, it would have grabbed them and installed them and then proceeded to install the rest of my packages. So once again, I'm going to utilize a little movie magic to make this go faster. Because normally this probably uh, would have taken about 20, 30 minutes to run with all the stuff I've got in there like Xcode and Office and everything else, big installers. And at this point, I have a VM that's ready to go. Um, I'm not at the setup assistant, I'm at the login window, and I'm logging in with my local admin. As you can see, I've got some customization going on. The hard drive got renamed, I've got an application sitting out on my desktop, I've got a customized dock. I'm ready to start testing. And the nice thing was is that I didn't have to do much work to get to this point. So I'm always a fan of doing, having the machine do more work and me do less work. So as mentioned previously, the limitations of the OS install environment mean that some packages won't install correctly. Now in particular, packages that use pre-install or post-install scripts as part of the normal installation process may fail to run properly as part of the OS installation process. Now, to help work around this limitation, I've developed a tool called First Boot Package Install Generator.app. And this is an application that generates installer packages that enables other packages to be installed during the initial boot of either a Mac or a VM. Now, this solves the issue because the installers are no longer running in the OS X install environment, and they can run any associated pre-install and post-install scripts that they need to. The First Boot Package Install Generator installer, along with the app's components and scripts, are available from GitHub using the link on the screen. Now, just keep in mind, all this is going to be available for download later, so no need to uh, copy down the link. So one potential use of the first few packages generated by this application would be to allow you to add a systems management agent like Casper to the OS installer. Now, once the agent reported in, uh, Casper could have its agent install additional software and scripts to configure your VM. So once again, you can make this very automated. If you don't want to use Create OS 10 install PKG, though, you don't have to. Uh, you should be able to install a disk image into a VM like you can on a Mac. Now, if you're not using Jamf's tools to create your image, I recommend using Pear Olufsen's Auto Damage tool. I'd also like to note that Auto Damage is how Pear himself has indicated he wants it to be pronounced. I myself have nothing but love and affection for this tool because it solved a ton of problems for me. Now, as described previously, my preferred way uh, to create VMs is by leveraging NetBoot and Deploy Studio but not all uh, environments are gonna ha have access to either NetBoot or Deploy Studio. Now for those environments, there are scripted ways to create customized Lion, Mount Lion, or Mavericks installer disk images for use with VMware Fusion. With Yosemite support hopefully coming soon, this is the kind of thing where Apple made some changes and we gotta figure out how best to support that. Now this allows the creation of OS X VMs that can configure themselves in an automated fashion without needing access to either NetBoot or server resources. So Tim Sutton from Concordia University in Montreal, Canada was the first person I know of who applied this to OS X VMs as part of his work with Vagrant and Packer. Now, if you haven't previously heard of it, Vagrant is a tool for building virtual machines in a con consistent, repeatable way using automated workflows. Now, it's popular with development teams because it allows everyone working on a project to spin up identical uh, virtual machines that contain their shared development environment. Now, in turn, Packer is a complementary open source tool that is used to build OS images for Vagrant to use when building new VMs. Now, as part of his work with Packer and Viwi, another open source tool for building OS images for Vagrant, Tim developed a script that would, create an, uh, that would convert an OS X installer into an ISO disk image that either Viwi or Packer could use. Now, I was able to build on Tim's work to develop a script that creates a customized OS X installer that can be used in VMware Fusion without the need for either Vagrant or Packer. Now, my method uses a first boot package to provide customization for the OS install. Now, as long as everything is configured according to the directions, uh, users of the script will be able to produce a VMware-ready installer disk image that will install OS X and the first boot package into a new VM. Now, when the VM boots, OS X and the first boot package will automatically install onto the VM's boot drive. And once the installation completes, the Mac will then reboot. On reboot, a log will be displayed while the packages included with the first boot package are installed into the VM. And once the package is finished installing, the VM will automatically reboot again. And after that second reboot, the VM set up with your desired applications and settings. So once again, the focus is on getting this automated, you know, making sure that the machine is doing the work and you are not. 
So I'd previously mentioned this in connection with a create OS 10 install PKG, but you can also use a systems management tool like Casper with a custom OS 10 install disk image to help build and configure your virtual machines. Now in this scenario, you can build a simple installation process for your VMs that installs just the OS and your Casper agent. Now once the agent on the VM phones home to the management service, Casper can have its agent on the VM download and install whatever is needed to configure that VM. Properly configured, this approach would allow VMs to be built with either no or very little effort on your part. So once I've got virtual machines built in VMware Fusion, I prefer to use those as templates or parent VMs. Now that way, I can use what I've built as a source for other VMs. So VMware Fusion 6 Professional added some functionality to facilitate this way of working by bringing the ability to clone VMs from VMware Workstation on Windows and adding it to VMware Fusion Professional on the Mac. Now, one thing I would like to say is that uh, this is a professional um, option. It's not available in the regular VMware Fusion. So if you want to take advantage of this option, you should really get VMware Fusion Professional. So there's two ways that you can clone a VM in VMware Fusion 6 Professional and later. And the first is by making a full clone, and the second is by making a linked clone. So what's the difference between the two ways of cloning? Well, a full clone is an independent copy of a virtual machine. Ongoing operation of a full clone is completely separate from the parent virtual machine, and either the clone or the parent VM can be deleted without affecting the other. In contrast, a linked clone is made from a snapshot of the parent VM. Now, a snapshot preserves the state and data of a virtual machine at a specific point in time. Uh, that state includes what's stored in memory, what applications were running, anything else the VM was doing at that particular point in time. Now, using a snapshot saves space because a linked clone can reference all files available on the parent VM as of the time of the linked clone's creation, but it doesn't actually store a complete copy of those files. Now, because a linked clone is a snapshot of another VM and it's not a complete copy, a linked clone must have continued access to the parent VM that the snapshot was made from. Without access to the parent VM, a linked clone stops working. Now, that said, changes to the parent VM do not affect the link clone, and any changes you make to the disk of the linked clone will not affect the parent. Basically, the link clone just acts like it's split off at a particular point in time, and uh, any changes you make to the link clone afterwards don't reflect back on your parent VM, which you're using as a template. So, when I'm using clones in Fusion, I have the following rules of thumb. I do a lot of testing where I'm using a particular clone once or twice, and then I'm tossing it. So in this case, where the test VM will only be around for a short time, a link clone makes a lot of sense because it saves on space and I don't have to worry about keeping it for the long term. Now, if I'm planning for a particular clone to stay around for a while, I make a full clone. Now, this way I don't have to worry about keeping track of the clone's parent VM because the full clone is a fully self-contained copy of the parent VM. So once you have a VM built, you may want to edit it to emulate a specific Mac model. Now, one reason for doing this would be to test model-specific updates from Apple Software Update. So the first step is to locate the model identifier of the Mac you want to emulate. Now, one way to do this is by checking a system profiler on an appropriate machine. So in the case of the machine on the screen, we're using the model identifier for a 2011 MacBook Pro. That should be something that's still fairly common in your environments. So to set your VM to report itself as a specific Mac model, you would need to add hardware model settings to your VM's configuration. Now to do this, select the VM and make sure it's not running. That's very important. Make sure it is shut down before you start editing it. Next, you'll hold down the option key on your keyboard and right click in the virtual machine. Next, you'll select open config file and editor and that'll make the VM's configuration available for editing. Now in the configuration editor, you'll add a line like that shown on the screen, substituting the actual model where I've got model here. Now once your edits are finished, save your changes. The next time you launch your VM, it should identify itself as being the specified Mac model. Now in the case of our example, the VM should now be identifying itself as a MacBook Pro. One issue you may run across in VMware Fusion VMs is that some services don't seem to work properly, even though they look like they should. Now in this case, I recommend checking what the hardware serial number is set to be. Uh, for example, in older guest OSs like 10.7 or 10.8, this number may be longer than the 12 characters that Apple's expecting a uh, max serial number to be. So in these cases, VMware has added a way to generate a serial number that is 12 characters long so that you can address this issue by adding settings to your VM's configuration file. Now to apply this, once again, shut down your VM and then open the configuration editor. In the configuration editor, you would add a line like that shown on the screen and then once your edits are finished, save your changes, restart the VM. 
When the VM starts up, the serial number should go from being that long string to now being no longer than 12 characters long. Now this may solve some issues with profiles not applying and other odd problems. Now this option is enabled by default in VMware Fusion for VMs running Mavericks and Yosemite, but you may need to set it for uh, VMs running Lion and Mountain Lion. So at this point, I'm gonna start talking about OS 10 VMs and VMware's ESXi server. Before I do though, I wanna say some things to hopefully save some questions later. So anytime I mention Apple, VMware, and ESXi in proximity to each other, I almost always have a conversation that goes like this. Someone asks if VMware is now supporting running OS X on non-Apple hardware. Sadly, I have to tell him no. Uh, OS X VMs are only supported on Apple hardware. The person usually responds that it would be nice if they could run OS X on their ESXi server or their vSphere cluster like they can with other operating systems. I fully agree with that opinion. It would be nice. <laughs> running OS X on non-Apple hardware is not a technical problem. It is a license issue. The people who can address this license issue work at the location shown on the screen. <laughs> so now that it's understood that I'm only talking about ESXi running on Apple hardware, let's talk about hosting OS 10 VMs on ESXi. Now, in particular, VMware brought some support over to ESXi 5.5 that completely changed how I built VMs on ESXi. And what changed is that VMware has now added Netboot support for ESXi hosted OS 10 VMs. In fact, you can stand up a Netboot server in one ESXi OS 10 VM and use it to boot other ESXi hosted OS 10 VMs. So needless to say, this greatly simplified my build process because I can now leverage the same Netboot deployment tools that I'm using with VMware Fusion. So support for Netboot in ESXi 5.5 has all but eliminated any need for me to build OS 10 VMs in Fusion first and then transfer them to an ESXi server. I can simply build them in place. Now, one difference between building OS 10 VMs in Fusion and building them in ESXi is that Fusion will format the VM's boot drive as part of the creation of the VM. ESXi hosted OS 10 VMs will need to have their drives formatted. Unfortunately, Deploy Studio's disk partitioning tools are not able to correctly detect the unformatted drive on an ESXi hosted OS 10 VM like you can on a Mac, so it's difficult to include an automated format of the drive as part of the VM build process. Now, fortunately, this issue can be solved while still booted into Deploy Studio, and presumably also if you have uh, Casper Imaging, you can also solve this in a similar way, because one of the tools available on the Deploy Studio boot set is Apple's Disk Utility, which I can use to format the drive and then run my Deploy Studio workflow on it. So even with the ability to host a Netboot server on ESXi, there's still gonna be environments where you just can't use Netboot. Now, you can solve this issue also using a tool that we previously looked at for VMware Fusion. One of the functions built into the custom OS X installer build script we discussed earlier is the option for creating an ISO disk image for use with ESXi. Now, selecting the option in the script to create an ISO for ESXi will create two disk images, one for VMware Fusion and the other one being an ISO for use with ESXi. Now you can use the ISO as an installer disk uh, for an ESXi VM, much like you can use an OS X disk image as an installer disk for VMware Fusion VMs. So let's take a look at what the process of building an ESXi hosted VM with a custom OS X installer looks like. Now in this instance, we're building a VM using Mavericks. In this case, I'm using the Windows vSphere tool since it gives me a, a number of options that I'll need to use. So I'm booted into Windows 7, launching the Windows vSphere client. Okay, so here's my ESXi server. Uh, as you can see, I don't have any VMs yet. So let me go fix that. I'm gonna go ahead and run new virtual machine. And that's gonna bring up the new virtual machine wizard. And pop that out. Uh, I'm gonna stick with the typical configuration. I'm gonna name it Mavericks VM. I only just have the one data store, so I'm gonna go ahead and select that. For my operating system, I'm gonna select other, and then if you notice that the only, the top option I have available is 10.764-bit, uh, and that's because that's the top option available in uh, the Windows vSphere client. However, that'll work fine for 10.8, 10.9, and 10.10 VMs as well, so go ahead and select that. I'm gonna select one network card. I'm gonna stick with the defaults for uh, the disk. 
and everything looks okay, but I do want to edit a few settings before uh, I complete the DM. So I'm going to go ahead and check that option for editing, and it'll bring up this editing window, where the first thing I want to do is I want to boost the RAM from two gigs to four gigs, because two gigs would just be painful. Uh, the other thing I'm going to do is OS 10 VMs really do want to have at least two processors, so I'm going to assign it two processors. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and add my ISO. So I'm going to go, I'd previously uploaded my ISO file. I'm going to go find where I stored it on my data store. I put it in this directory called ISOs. There's my Mavericks install ISO. I'm going to go ahead and select that. And then very important, go and click this connected power on button because that actually tells the VM it has an optical drive uh, connected. Don't be like me a few times where I forgot to check that off and then I started the VM and then nothing happened. I'm like, what's going on? Is it broken? No, I just forgot something. So everything's all set up properly. So let's go ahead and go into the virtual machine console. Let's pop that out full screen. And then let's get our VM started. So we're booting off the ISO. And one of the things I am able to build into the ISO is the ability to automatically format that drive. So it just went ahead, it selected uh, the drive on the, uh, inside the VM. It went ahead and installed Mavericks, it installed that first boot uh, install package. And now it's gonna go ahead and reboot. And once again, if only all OS installers work that fast. If only. Little movie magic again. So now at this point, it's rebooting for the second time for the first boot uh, packages to install. So what's gonna happen at this point is this log window is gonna come up, it's gonna block access to uh, the setup assistant so people won't be able to get in, start messing around with things. In fact, if you quit this application, it'll just respawn. Um, so it went through, installed all my packages, my Casper agent, my, uh, my necessary scripts, you know, manual triggers for policies that I have running, and then here we go. It, it completely set up my VM, it did everything I need to, this VM is ready for testing, and whatever else I want to do with it. So once you have your VM stood up on your ESXi server, one new feature in VMware Fusion 7 Professional is that you can connect to your ESXi server from Fusion and manage your VMs. So this is brand new uh, as of VMware Fusion 7 Professional, which came out in September. Um, and it's a feature that I'm very excited about because it now means I don't have to go to the Windows, uh, Windows vSphere client quite so much. Gives me some basic information about my ESXi server, but honestly the thing that I love the most is that I can just double click on the remote VM and it'll pop up that console view. So I can manage my VM from VMware uh, Fusion 7 Professional. I didn't have to launch a Windows VM and it made me very happy. So one issue you may run across in ESXi VMs is that the hardware serial number, again, may be set to be longer than the 12 characters that Apple's expecting a Mac serial number to be. Now, you can f fix this by using roughly the same method that you would in VMware Fusion. Now to apply this, shut down the VM, once again, very important that it be off, and then open the configuration editor. And in this case, I'm running it through uh, the Windows VSR client. Now in the configuration editor, you would add a line like that shown on the screen, and then once your edits are finished, save your changes and restart the VM. So we did all this work. We've stood up virtual machines. We've hardly talked about Casper. What can you test? The whole point of this is to get you to a test environment. It may be more accurate to say, what can't you test? So a good example of something that you can test in a VM is Casper's profile management. You can test how your profile settings will apply in a VM before deploying them to the rest of your environment. So in this example, we're applying a login window profile using the policy option shown. Policy options can be set up exactly like they would be for an actual machine in your environment. And the only thing that's gonna be different is that you're assigning them to a test virtual machine instead of to an actual machine. And on the VM's end, you can check the profile to see how it applies just like you can on an actual machine. And you can also verify the settings to make sure what's being applied is what you expect. So before it even hits a single actual box, you can make sure it's working, and that's huge. Another thing you can test is Casper's Bobble 2 management. Now, this has been handy to me in particular because I can snapshot a VM and capture it in an unencrypted state before proceeding to encrypt the VM. Now, if the testing doesn't go like I expected, I can roll back to the snapshot and I instantly have an unencrypted VM 
that's ready to go for the next round of testing. I didn't have to decrypt, I didn't have to boot to anything to like wipe out the core storage volume. I just roll back to the snapshot, I'm ready to go again. That saves a ton of time. It's a beautiful thing to have snapshots. And this is my favorite thing that I found that I could test in a VM. I found this very recently, and I don't want to ruin the surprise. So if anyone wants to know, can you test Casper's remote system lock in a VM? The answer is yes. I didn't think this would work. I tested it, I was like, oh, it works, it's awesome. Let me test remote wipe. That doesn't work. <laughs> but uh, if you need to, for example, you need to demo to somebody how remote you know, system lock works, you can do it in a VM. Um, and you know, it just, it works, it just works, and it's just beautiful. And once again, this gets back to what, you, what can you test? More like what you can't. Because that, that can't test list is gonna be a lot shorter than the can test list. So last but not least, you can virtualize your entire test environment. Now assuming that you can run your virtualization service on Apple hardware, both your Casper test boxes and the Casper test server can all be run in a virtual environment. Maybe you're running them all on the same machine. Even if you can't run your virtualization services on Apple hardware, Jamsnet SUS, Casper 9's JDS, and the JSS can all be run on non-Apple operating systems. Now that allows you to virtualize the server end and it gives you the flexibility to add remove and change virtual machines as needed. In my own shop, I'm running uh, our Casper JSS on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And one thing I always do before a Casper upgrade is I call up our uh, you know, VMware administrator. I'm like, so can I have a snapshot of the server before I make my changes? He's like, sure. And if I break anything, roll that snapshot back. And I'm back to where I was. That's a beautiful thing to have. Not that it you know, necessarily reduces the, uh, the tension level somewhat, but it is nice to know that I can hit the rewind button if needed. So VMs do have some limitations because they're software construction, they're not actual hardware. Now, here's what I found can't be tested in a virtualized environment. Anything involving having an Apple registered hardware serial number and sending that hardware serial number back to Apple. So this in cloud includes iCloud services like Find My Mac and Messages. And it also applies to getting hardware-specific OS installers via Recovery HD. Now, some of these services may look like they're working on the VM's end, but they will show up oddly on Apple's. Uh, a recent example that I found is that you can enable Find My Mac in a VM, and it will show up in iCloud's Find My iPhone site. It will show up as an iPhone. <laughs> And none of the commands I was running from uh, the Find My iPhone site on, I on iCloud were working quite like I expected. Uh, the only thing that I found that worked was the whole, you know, send a sound and display a message. That worked fine. I tried remote wipe, that didn't work. I tried remote lock, that didn't work. Because the commands that the VM was receiving were for an iPhone or an iOS device, not for an OS X device. Most things involving EFI, so functions like Apple's internet recovery or holding down the option key to get a list of bootable volumes will not work. However, some things involving EFI work specifically because VMware made them work. For example, both NetBoot and FileVault 2 work fine in a VMware VM. Wireless connections. Your Mac does not have a Wi-Fi, uh, excuse me, your VM does not have a Wi-Fi card, though it may be talking to your network via your Mac's Wi-Fi connection. Now you can test in a VM to make sure that your Wi-Fi settings apply. You can't actually test to verify that they work. This is gonna be a category where, you know, you're still gonna need that test laptop, you're still gonna maybe need that test iMac. So like for example, if you've got 802.11x, you need to test to make sure that works over Wi-Fi. There you're still gonna need an actual test box because a VM, all it knows is that it's got ethernet. So sadly, can't do wireless testing in a VM yet. Who knows? So as Mac admins, we're always up against the clock for testing. In my own environment, I've become reliant on virtual machines to speed up my development and testing cycle while reducing the physical footprint of uh, my test machines. So instead of, needing, instead of needing multiple test machines to test changes to my deployment workflows, my testing now takes place almost exclusively on a quad-core Retina MacBook Pro with 16 gigs of RAM. Likewise, having NetBoot and Deploy Studio available to build test VMs means that I can be testing multiple workflows simultaneously on the same laptop. So if a particular build hits a problem, I can discard that VM, fix the problem, and then quickly build a new VM with that updated software. So like for example, we got Mavericks, 
Behind that, I got mountain lion. Behind that, I got lion. And they're all running at the same time. So I can test them all, get them all set up, make sure everything is working the way I expect. And I didn't need multiple machines. And I, if it, something broke, I just toss that virtual machine and start over. Saves a ton of time. So to sum up, virtual machines plus automated build processes equals more time for you. So virtual machines running OS 10 can be resource hogs, as you'll need to assign at least two processors, as well as three to four gigabytes of RAM to have them run at usable speeds. Now, that said, the time and resources savings realized by using virtual machines instead of actual hardware should help make the case for investing in one or two speedy Macs running virtual machines instead of a multitude of actual test machines. So, because you can never get too much information on this topic, um, I have a few useful links. Uh, top two are from a colleague of mine, Vanessa White, who works for New Relic. Uh, she put together a very uh, exhaustive setup on how she got uh, ESXi installed on Mac minis for her own shop. Um, bottom two links uh, are from my own blog, where I'm talking, the third one is where I'm talking about the ESXi management for uh, VMware Fusion. At the time, I was talking about the technology preview, but basically the same information applies to VMware Fusion 7 Professional. Um, also, emulating specific Mac models. Other useful links, William Land of <coughs> VMware has a fantastic blog called Virtual, uh, Virtually Ghetto. Um, he has done a ton of work with running OS X on ESXi. Uh, he's the one who got you know, started with that I'm aware of that got started with installing ESXi on minis. He's done a lot of write-up on it. If you want a, a one-stop resource, he's the guy. I really recommend checking out his site. So more links, more links, including uh, links to uh, the application I talked about, first boot package install generator app, and also uh, up on GitHub, uh, the part of the monkey repo that has a uh, create OS 10 install PKG and possibly the most useful link you will see in this entire presentation. Here's how you download this entire presentation. You got PDFs and keynote slides. I'm gonna leave those up on the screen, and I think, um, how much time do we have for Q&A? All right, 20 minutes, sounds good to me. Uh, so, John, if you wouldn't mind, let's go ahead and take some questions. Yeah, let's, uh, let's take some questions. Does anyone have a question? That one right here? So the question is, how do you capture apps that use OpenGL? I don't know. <laughs> you may have things to teach me in that department. I honestly haven't tried. Great Probably answer. Specifically. We've got another question up here. Yes? So the question is, what is your recommended hardware? Uh, if you're running, is this for ESXi? The black Mac Pros just got certified for ESXi 5.5, so you'll need to install ESXi 5.5, update them to patch 03. This is very new, uh, so I would recommend using the Mac Pros. Um, the Mac Minis will work. They're not certified. They're not officially supported. Uh, so it's, it's one of those things, what's your budget, what's your comfort level with support? Other questions? Yes? The question is, are you still limited to two virtual machines? And I believe that's the that is, licensing. That is Apple's limitation. That is, um, VMware tries very hard to stay within Apple's EULA. Uh, they do not have a limitation on how many OS X VMs you can run. It's gonna be one of those things that the governing uh, licensing here is gonna be Apple's EULA more than anything else. Um, that, there's some argument as to whether or not, you know, that means you can run two versions of OS 10 total, or you can run like one per version of OS 10, so you could have one for Lion, one for Mad Lion, one for Mad, and so on and so forth. Uh, that, that's something I don't necessarily want to get into, but in terms of the two uh, limitation, that is specifically coming from Apple's EULA. Questions up there? Uh, 
Uh, this is something where I've actually been working with an older Mac Pro, in which case I've been using internal storage for that because you can just keep shoving into the base. Unfortunately, I don't have access to a, a black Mac Pro at this point to discuss the internal storage. However, with the ESXi 5.5, um, you do have the option for uh, connecting over NFS so that uh, if you have a fast enough um, Ethernet network, and of course you can get a 10 gigabit uh, Thunderbolt you know, adapter for uh, 10 gig Ethernet, you may want to look into using NFS because that's the kind of thing where you, you kind of stop caring what kind of storage is on the other end. The only thing you care about is can I access it via NFS? And VMware makes it very easy to talk to NFS data stores. So for the video, that question was about the limited storage in the new black Mac Pros. Yes. Another Thank you question very much. up in the balconies there. So the question is, has the install for ESXi gotten any less obscure on Apple hardware? Um, could you define less obscure? It was pretty challenging in the past. Based on the virtual ghetto. Right. Uh, and uh, the follow-up was basically, you know, that this can be complicated based on what's showing up on virtual ghetto. It really depends on if the support you need is in uh, the ESXi ISO that you're using. For example, one reason to stick with the, Mac, uh, the black Mac Pro now instead of using the minis will be that since it's officially supported, all the driver support you're going to need is going to be baked in to the default install. Where you're getting into uh, you know, baking more things in is on unsupported hardware, officially unsupported hardware like the mini, where you may need to bring in like Ethernet drivers or other things. I can also speak to that just a little bit. In my experience, uh, I think it was 5.1 there were some drivers for the Ethernet that you had to slip in for the Mac Mini. Yeah. And now on 5.5, five, uh, I found that just works natively out of the box. So I think the short answer to your question might be yes, it's gotten a little easier. Yeah, uh, it will be your mileage may vary. If possible, stick to what's on VMware's uh, supported hardware list. Yes. Uh, it's, yeah, it's vCenter. Uh, so the question was, do you use templates for your VMs, and are there any gotchas that you've run into with those? I should probably say that my experience with the ESXi, because I am poor, uh, involves the free version of ESXi, where I don't, necess I don't have access to like, uh, the vCenter uh, web interface and a lot of the nice features. So generally, I'm not using templates with ESXi. Um, it's one of those things where I simply don't have experience with it. However, there's a whole bunch of people out there using vCenter and that, you know, they're a Google search away from being able to give you the, the answers to those questions. I have and it does work. Excellent. See? Right in this room. Okay, so for the video, the two gentlemen who just spoke up said basically that it should work just fine with the templating on vCenter. Got one way up in the back. Okay, uh, that, I think um, to sum up that, your mileage may vary depending on the services that you're hosting. Uh, the cited example was AFP, where if you clone, uh, it will basically, the th apparently the three AFP, uh, the three machines AFP services will, will share something in common and they'll fight amongst each other. So if you're setting up AFP, it may be worthwhile to just set up a new OS 10 VM. Over here. So the question is, has NetBoot gotten more reliable in VMware Fusion? Um, could you define, uh, you're having some problems, or? <laughs> um, in my environment, I, 
basically that for the video, the gentleman was having some problems with uh, Netboot. In my environment, I haven't seen issues. Uh, the one thing I have seen uh, in VMware Fusion 7 Professional has been that I'm finding, especially when I've got both uh, on my host Mac, I've got both Ethernet and Wi-Fi connected at the same time. I have seen it try both connections and fail. And in that case, what I have to do is hold down the end key on the keyboard to make my VM locate and boot that default netboot set. Um, that's something new with VMware Fusion 7 Professional, but in general, once I get, net, once I get it to see netboot, I don't have it, I, I haven't seen issues. It's been very rock solid for me. Over here. That for the, for the display dongles, um, I mean, you can set, you can, yeah, I mean, well, what you can do in the VMware Fusion VMs, and I'm, I don't recall if I can do this on the ESXi, but in the VMware Fusion VMs, you can actually specify a MAC address to use. Uh, no, I take that back. You can generate a new MAC address to use. You cannot insert your own, I don't think. Um, because I've used that a couple times, generating a new MAC address to get myself out of a DHCP conflict problem. Uh, I'm gonna put that into the category of I don't know. Um, yeah, you did. And you know what, that happens. So for the video, the question was related to using Ethernet dongles with VMs. And my answer was I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else? Over here. The question is, how many VMs can a Mac Mini handle before the performance tanks? Uh, before, how many, how many pieces of wood can that wood chuck chuck? How long is a piece of string? Indeed. Um, the, your limitation there is going to be limited, is going to be processors before anything else, because you want to give your OS 10 VMs uh, at least a couple of processors, and I, you generally want to leave at least one free for ESXi itself to run with. Um, so, on my own, uh, home setup where I've got a Mac, a 2011 Mac Mini. I've got uh, a Linux VM, a uh, that's got one processor assigned, a OS 10 VM that has one processor assigned. This was before I really learned you should have multiple processors assigned, and uh, another VM that also has one processor assigned. And because I have a, a dual, it's a dual core. Uh, Mac Mini with hyper-threading, I have basically four cores to work with. So three of the cores are, op are occupied with VMs, one core is left over for ESXi, and I generally don't see issues. Um, one thing that I'm looking to see if I can do is actually snag one of the uh, late 2012 Mini servers before they uh, disappear forever, because they have more processors. So I, once again, now that the Mac Pros are supported, uh, I would say if you're looking to set this up in your own shop, get one of those because then you will have a plethora of processors to work with. So we had two up here. We'll go with the gentleman more towards the middle first. What are some of the captions that you have when you're deleting a VM? You know, you mentioned you spawn off the small and you use it. It checks in with your JSS. And then now you've got this inventory record hanging up. How often do you have to go through and kind of flush out your inventory of old stuff? So the question was relating to deleting VMs once they've already been enrolled in your JSS and how do you clean up that inventory? How often do you clean up that inventory uh, to make sure it doesn't get all cluttered? Generally, I, well, one thing I do is I make sure I name my VMs a particular naming uh, scheme so that it makes it easy then to just go search in the JSS, find all the ones that match that particular naming scheme, and then just delete them out. Uh, I should be able to tell pretty easily which, which are the ones that I've been using, which are the ones I've been testing with. Um, for the rest, it's basically like, how often do you flush out your normal machines? You know, Really think of virtual machines as just normal machines that don't actually happen to run 
on an actual hardware, piece of hardware. So I would say just treat them like that as much as you can and just use your normal policies for that. So another question up here. So the question was backing up VMs on ESXi. Um, once again, this is gonna be more of a support and budget issue more than anything else. I would say uh, that uh, for myself, I'm trying to remember the name of it, uh, William Lamb actually developed a script that works on uh, free and paid ESXi that will back up your VMs. And I'm blanking on the name. But if you search for Anyone know this, the name of this script? It's the one he developed for backing up virtual machines off of ESXi. Anybody? And I just can't remember. But at any rate, so he developed a script that does it. Um, I believe that there's also free versions of Veeam available. Uh, of course, there's a couple ways you can back up your VM. You can back up your VM from inside the guest OS, so in which case install your regular backup client or crash plan or whatever else you need to, and you can back it up from the inside, or you can use a VM tool uh, you know, that can back up the actual VM itself to back it up from the outside. So you actually have two different ways of backing it up, and it really depends what's more important. Do you want to get the, what's inside, or do you want to grab the whole VM? Question over here. So I, I, I think uh, the, the question there was, so if you're using vMotion, if you're using high availability with your uh, VMware infrastructure, how well does this all work? And since I'm using ESXi uh, free, I don't have access to vMotion. I have spoken to some colleagues who actually have uh, vSphere and it's, it just works. It's one of those nice things where it seems to just work when they've tested it. Um, once again, this is something that I'm passing on from someone else that I've heard. Please, you know, do your own research. Please confirm that. But as far as I'm aware, you know, uh, when you're running uh, ESXi on a mini, uh, excuse me, on a Mac Pro, it's at that point it's not running OS 10 anymore. It's just running ESXi, and it's going to be able to have access to all the capabilities that ESXi has. In which case, you're just the hardware is app, is Apple. Everything else is VMware. It works. Cool. Okay, so we've had some additional confirmation that those features are supported. So, but once again, test it out in your own environments, make sure it works like you want it to. But in general, the consensus in the room from the folks who have experience with it uh, is that it works. Got a question over here. Have you tried creating a caching server on a VM? Yes, it works. Um, what you'll want to do is make sure that you have uh, the serial number set to that 12 character limit. Once you do that, it works fine. Just make sure you allocate enough storage. I can confirm that too. Yep. You're actually the one that tipped me off on the serial number thing. Yeah, I actually. I my head against the wall for two days. Yes, very important to have that serial number be short enough because if Apple doesn't recognize that serial number, yeah, you, stuff doesn't work right. Yeah, apps, yeah there's, there's the short version, get that 12 character serial number, else weird things may happen. I'll just, you know, shorten it up. We have one back here. Ooh, that's a good question. What are the advantages of ESXi over VMware Fusion? Um, well, one advantage for uh, using ESXi over VMware Fusion um, is going to be, for example, uh, you know, in general, VMware Fusion is something that I have installed on my own laptop, where I, you know, want to take the laptop home and all this other kind of stuff. Uh, where ESXi just basically lives on a box in the back. But another thing is that ESXi has less overhead between um, your VMs and the hardware. So when you're running VMware Fusion, you also have to account for the fact that you have the overhead of running OS 10, then you have the overhead of running Fusion, <laughs> then you have the resources that are left over 
available for your VMs, where ESXi is basically, you know, it tries to be as low resource as possible, so to give as many resources as possible to your VMs. So I would say that's the big advantage there. Uh, I will say, however, that VMware Fusion is gonna be faster at supporting new versions of OS X than ESXi is, um, and that's not a, a slam on ESXi. They have a lot to account for where VMware Fusion can accommodate just running on the Macs. So they can be, so VMware Fusion can be a bit more nimble in that regards. But VMware has also been very good about making sure that uh, ESXi does catch up eventually. So I actually have a question for you, Rich. Have you quantified how much time you've saved using these workflows? Have I quantified? Um, well, a good example of that is going to be uh, when I was developing, I, actually just developed first boot uh, install package generator that app this previous weekend. And why I did that is that Apple introduced a change for net install that also affected create OS 10 install PKG, where the only type of packages that you could now use are distribution style flat packages. So you can't add bundle packages anymore. You can't even add just regular flat packages. They have to be distribution style flat packages. So I needed to build a tool and test it. And I needed to test it on 10.7, 10.8, 10.9, 10.10. I needed to repeatedly test it. I needed to make sure that everything was working properly. I needed to make sure that when I released this tool, I could stand behind it and said, this works. Because I could use VMs, I was able to do that in a weekend. If I didn't have VMs, I'd probably still be rounding up test machines. I'd have to go find that thing that runs 10.7. I'd have to go find that thing that runs 10.10. I'd have to you know, get them all. My, my office would look like an enormous junk pile. I got it done in a weekend, thanks to VMs. If I didn't have them, I'd still be working on it. So to quantify that kind of time, it saves you a ton of time. Or it has for me. So the question was if there's any GUI scripting tools that you use to run through these workflows or if you've just been doing it all manually so far. I have to say I have not uh, used GUI scripting tools to do this. Where I've done my automation has generally been with uh, the first boot packages where in that case they can have, I just need to get all the packages lined up, toss them in, and at that point it handles the setup for me. Uh, that's where I've been doing my automation, not necessarily on the GUI uh, scripting end. Um, Trying to think who I know who has done something similar. Charles Edge has done something, not for VM specifically, but he's used uh, some GUI scripting tools for automating his testing. And uh, Alistair Banks, who's sadly not here, um, he is, he's also done some testing that way. I just haven't. So we've got one right here. So the question was, can you configure VM to use a specific serial number that you've defined? To the best, of, with VMware Fusion, to the best of my knowledge, the answer is no. Um, that may be simply because I haven't run across the right configuration setting in the VM configuration file, but to the best of my knowledge, the answer there is no. If you're using parallels, I believe parallels will actually reflect the serial number of the host machine it's running on. So you can pick up, you can force a serial number that way, I'm not necessarily sure if that's necessarily great because once again, now you have two machines that share a serial number. Uh, so I have not found a way. That doesn't mean that there isn't a way. I just haven't found it. So we have time for one more question. Who's got a really good one? No pressure. Really good ones. Close out the show. Nobody? Nobody? 42. 42. We'll do that. All right, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, I believe it's lunchtime now. Uh, Rich is going to be around the rest of the conference if you guys want to follow up with more questions.
We'll see you around. Thank you so much for coming.